Hey guys, Zom Fox here, and today it is time to do the UFL Week 5 Power Rankings for the 2024 season. We have now gotten through four weeks of the UFL season, and this past week was a pretty big deal. We had the first ever USFL versus XFL conference matchup for the entire week. Every single game was in a USFL versus XFL team. We ended up seeing it finish out 2-2 two and two to create the overall record of 4-4. Four and four. And with that, we also saw the first ever UFL tank bowl. So the overall power rankings have definitely shifted a bit. And it's still a really hard power rankings to judge. Now, while number 1 and 8 are still pretty clear cut, spots 4 to 7, once again, are a very tough area to kind of rank. As you could very well argue certain teams should be here or there. But I'm going to give you what I believe. So without further ado, let's get right on into the power rankings with number 8, the Arlington Renegades. The Arlington Renegades clearly are the worst team in the league now. You hate to see it, but it's pretty obvious why. Look, I live streamed the entire tank bowl that they had. I just had a tank bowl video come out yesterday. And the fact is they got just outplayed by the Roughnecks. Look, in the end, they got beaten in a lot of categories they really shouldn't have, especially in total yardage. But their third down percentage being down to 2 of 10 was really bad. That was their worst across the season by a country mile. And what makes it even worse is that once again, their rushing attack was still pretty poor. Not a single running back or even quarterback averaged over 3 yards a carry. And this was Luis Perez's worst game as a passer this season. And their defense is still among one of the league's worst. It is the second to last in points allowed and is one of the worst in yards allowed as well. The fact is that even though this game ended 17-9, the Renegades were really never fully in it. They had one drive going where they almost were able to pull off a touchdown. But in the end, they didn't. And that was because of a bad penalty that they ended up getting. They did a bad block from Canella and that caused them a penalty. But even without that, there were a lot of other chances the team had they just didn't capitalize on. And now they are the only winless team in the league. And while some people might argue that they should be 7 because one team that has a win has still looked really bad. Nah. The Renegades are the worst team in the league at this point. They need a win to go away from that. So number 8 is going to be the Renegades. Now in terms of their season projection, currently, they're going to miss the playoffs. Like... I talked about this both in the live stream and in the Tank Bowl video. The fact is that 0-4 with two teams that are 3-1 in your conference and the third team is 2-2, two and two, it ain't looking good. Look, the best they can finish is 6-4. and four, And if they finish 6-4, and four, they're going to have to hope that they get the tiebreaker edge on one of, if not both, the Battlehawks and Brahmas and have both those teams end up only winning three more games. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. The fact is this 0-4 start is a really bad start, especially when a lot of these players are looking worse now. And it, it really does suck because they already lost the game to the Battlehawks. So being able to catch up to the Battlehawks is a very tall ask that I don't think they can pull off. And they lost to the Defenders as well. So they're already 0-2 in their conference, and it just doesn't look good for them. So their current projection is definitely to miss the playoffs. The, even if they were in the USL conference, it would still be a tough ask. Because again, the highest they can finish is 6-4. and four. And when you have two teams in your conference that already have half of that amount of wins, it ain't looking good for them. So the Renegades currently are probably going to miss the playoffs. Them making the playoffs would be an absolute miracle. Because we even saw last year with the Memphis Showboats in the USFL that just having a five-game win streak is not enough to guarantee you a playoff spot. So definitely miss the playoffs, their current projection. Then falling another spot is going to be the Memphis Showboats. They fall another spot, few spots or because, um, I mean, they just have to. Look, this was a bad game against the Battle Hawks. The team got absolutely obliterated statistically. 355 total yards to 127 is absolutely horrendous. And then when you consider the fact that the Battle Hawks had a bunch of penalty yards the Showboats couldn't even capitalize on, is crazy. They were 1 for 8. Yes, 1 for 8 in third downs. Now, yes, their red zone offense did pick it up. They were 2 of 3, which is one of their better performances. But time of possession, they got absolutely manhandled. 38 and a half minutes to 21 and a half minutes. They got no sacks, whereas the Battlehawks, who were missing two of their best pass rushers, by the way, were still able to get four sacks and constant pressure. Once again, we saw both Troy Williams and Case Cookus play. And once again, neither of them looked all that good. This offensive line was supposed to be elite, and it's been absolute garbage. And what's crazy is the fact that this team is still technically really good in the turnover differential. Their plus three is the best in the league, yet they're not even able to do anything with it because even though they're not turning the ball over that much compared to how much they're taking it away, I mean, if you can't really go anywhere, it doesn't matter. And you see that with the fact that their rushing game is one of the worst in the league. 3.1 yards per rush is absolutely atrocious, and it went up this week. Their 58 rushing yards per game is one of the worst. 
Their points allowed is the worst, and their yardage allowed is up there as well. This team just doesn't have a good defense, and it doesn't necessarily have any run game. And their pass game is all dependent on how good their O-line can block. The Showboats are not looking good right now. The fact is they have a lot of high-end talent, but the big question was could it mesh together? And now that we're four weeks into the season, they don't really have much time to get it back together. They need to get a win this next week to stay in contention. So we'll see. Now their current season production is a playoff hopeful. The fact is they still have the most high high end talent on offense and arguably the whole league. Well, not in terms of the whole offense, but as I've talked about in terms of their big five, it still is the highest potential. When you talk about the the ceiling of guys like Jerron Jones, Case Cookus, Jay Adams, Sage Rot, and Darius Victor, there isn't a group of five better than that. When you're talking about your number one player from your O line, quarterback, wide receiver, tight end, running back, it's just that Jerron Jones has been awful this season. Vito hasn't really been that good, but it's a question of how much is it on him and how much is it on the O-line, and same with Cookus. So when three of your five big players aren't doing anything and two of them are de- that are doing good are dependent on one of them that isn't doing good, there's only so much you can do. But again, this team still has the high-end talent to make a run to the title game. But if they don't fix their O-line, there's not much they can do. And their defense, it's more of a question of how good are they really? Because the fact is that the defense is stuck on the field all the time. They almost never get chances to rest because the Showboat's offense just gets three and outs like religiously. So because of that, their current projection is playoff hopeful. Thanks to the Panthers losing this week, they're still just a game behind. So they very much could, you know, get right back into the thick of things. But we'll see. Now, coming in number six is the Houston Roughnecks. The Roughnecks rise two spots, and shouldn't be a shock. I mean, most people expected the Renegades to win this game, even with Mark back. The Roughnecks just beat them. I mean, like I said with the Renegades, it wasn't really that close. The final score showed it was close, but like I said, as someone who was literally watching this as a live stream, yeah, no. The Roughnecks just beat them. The fact is the Roughnecks, their biggest weakness is their rushing attack. That's what it's been, or one of their biggest weaknesses. But it's going to get better now that Mark is back. The fact is, especially early on, and I was talking about this in the live stream, is that they weren't utilizing Mark as an every down back because they were trying to, you know, not get him hurt, get him back in the swing of things. So the fact is that I expect this rushing weakness to get better. Now, their third down percentage is where there's a real question. Their 33% on third down is the worst in the league. The Brahmas are second to worst, and they're at 37%. That is horrific. The Roughnecks, when they get a third down, it's almost a guarantee that they're not converting it. They need to get that stat up very quick because if that's a low stat, that's the kind of stat that's going to end up costing you a chance to make the playoffs. Now, I will say Reed Sinet still, once again, is proving to be the quarterback this team should rely on. They should not go back to Garantano when he's healthy. And again, Mark did play pretty good considering the fact this was his first game in a while and that he's been injured. And even though his average was pretty bad when you eliminate the 12-yard rush, the fact is that he made a couple of clutch runs, and TJ Pledger still was a okay backup. In the end, the Roughnecks definitely deserve to move up a couple spots. This is definitely their best game they've played all season. Their defense completely held the Renegades offense, which had looked really solid aside from their rushing game throughout the season. It just held them completely in check, and they were able to do enough. Now, granted, Curtis Johnson tried to say that, you know, the Roughnecks is the best offense in the league is... When asked about it, he said it's the best offense in the league regarding the Roughnecks, which, no, it's not. Maybe put up more than 20 points and we'll start talking, which is going to be one of the worst sound bites in the, the league for sure. But the point is, is that the Roughnecks did their best performance of the season, and this is a big one. Like I said in the Tank Bowl video, like I said on the live stream, if you lost this game, you were going to miss the playoffs almost guaranteed. Now they're right back in it, and just like the Showboats, they're a playoff hopeful. Again, did lose to the Panthers, so they're already down in the head-to-head to them. But again, one win and one Panthers loss puts you both at 2-3. Two, two wins and two Panthers losses, you're ahead of them. And the Roughnecks are getting hot when it matters. Now that the Panthers and Showboats are both reeling and falling, the Roughnecks can do this. And again, even though the Roughnecks are playing the Stallions this week, look, we all expect the Roughnecks to pull off one win against the Stallions because the Gamblers did it twice. Will it be the first game? I don't know. But if they do beat the Stallions, it really wouldn't be a shock. So they very well could end up giving a loss to the 4-0 Stallions while getting up to 2-3. So the Roughnecks definitely can still make the playoffs. And like I said before, this is a team I still would genuinely say if they make the playoffs, they're the team you probably should pick to win the championship game. Because if they make the playoffs, 
It's going to be because their defense gets healthy or gets back on track, and it's going to be because Mark Thompson is playing like a beast. So, playoff hopeful. The number five is the DC Defenders. Look, I've seen some people put them at like four and even argue three. I- I'm sorry, no. Number one, your win against the Renegades was one of the just, really both their wins are insanely wacky. I mean, we talked about the Brahmas, like first two wins being fluky. The Defenders are really up there as well. It took them a fourth and 12 play and then an insane pass, not even insane, just a decent pass to beat the Renegades. And then they basically tried to hand the game to the Roughnecks earlier. Look, this game against the Stallions shows why the defenders are not a good team and why they're just a mediocre team. The Stallions did everything they could to throw this game, even worse than what the defenders did against the Roughnecks. Two literal less than 10-yard fumbles the Stallions did. Two times the Stallions had basically guaranteed touchdowns or at least three points. They fumbled it away, and the defenders still couldn't win. The Stallions had like a negative three turnover differential or a negative two turnover differential. And then we're able to put up like 14 unanswered points against the defenders. The Stallions were 0-4 in the red zone. The Stallions used the wrong quarterback. This was a rainy game. You're supposed to run the ball. They decided to keep Corral in there, who's the throwing quarterback, instead of put Martinez in. So the Stallions did all they could to lose this game. And the defenders still lost. Yeah, the defenders are becoming highly overrated because of this. This was not a good performance by the defenders. Tiamu was very okay. He threw a lot of incompletions, but again, it was rainy, so some of it's not really on him. He still had two TDs, no interceptions, but he had a pretty bad completion percentage. Again, it was the rain, so we don't know how far to judge it. Zaquandre Wright had one really great run. Aside from that, not so much. Cameron Harris, overall, very solid. He's been pretty much the same the whole year. He's been tech like efficiency-wise, technically bad, but hasn't actually played bad, you know what I mean? But White had one great run, aside from that, not much. And then, of course, you also have the fact that, again, look, I, I gave him a lot of credit before the season, but Reggie Barlow is, is very fast just going down on my coach rankings. The fact is, is that they had a very doable third and four. Then they got a false start penalty. Now it's a third and nine. Then Tayambu scrambles and gets seven yards. It is fourth and two. There's like a minute left. That is more than enough time to get into field goal range. The defenders quite literally did that to the Renegades. Yet for some unbelievably stupid reason, they kick a field goal. That is a terrible decision. There is no arguing that that's a good one. Your defense has not shown at all in the fourth quarter to be able to just get an instant stop the way you need. The Stallions already had just driven down the field to get a field goal. And you're leaving a minute on the clock. They're going to get it because now they have to go for it in fourth downs. They're going to get it. But for some reason, they decide to just kick the field goal. They make it, but then they give so much time for the Stallions that after one good return, and they didn't even really play all that good after the return, they still got into field goal range and ended the game. So, it's just, coaching decisions are still very, very, very skeptical. And very, not that good for the defenders. Again, they uh, once again are handing games away. Even though they were handed the win, they somehow just gave it back. So, it's hard to put a team that did their best to throw against the Roughnecks, took took an absolute miracle to beat the Renegades, who had a right tackle throw the game and was undisciplined in week one. Because really, to this point, their week one game against the Brahmas was the best game they've had all year. Because it was their right tackle and a fluke play from the Brahmas that made them lose that game. Since that game, they have just looked really not that good. But they're number five in the power rankings because, again, they're still competitive. They still are beating teams that they should be. But, again... This was more of the Stallions proving how good they are, that no matter what they do, no matter how bad they play, they still get the W. The defenders, I mean, seriously, if the Stallions were playing the Panthers, the Brahmas or the Battlehawks, the three teams above the defenders that aren't the Stallions, they win this game against the Stallions. A good team will take advantage of that and win. The defenders didn't. They deserve to be down here at five. It's still a good spot for them because, again, 
Despite being two and two, they really, you could argue, be one and three, putting them at five. They are currently a playoff hopeful. They're two and two. Um, I'm gonna be honest, it's just this is a team I would have no faith in making the play and winning the championship. If I were to be honest, I'd probably say this team is like one of the bottom two, if not bottom three, in terms of championship caliber. I just don't see this team as it. I think they could make the playoffs just by getting lucky and just, you know, kind of just fluking their way into it, much like we saw the Panthers do last year. As even though the Maulers and Panthers are both four and six, the Maulers, everybody's like, yeah, they deserve it. The Panthers, it's like, wait, really? The defenders feel like they could do that. They could fluke their way into the playoffs, but then just get beat. Look, the defenders so far have really not looked impressive at all. Teamu's looked very decent, but again, their running game is still not that good. Again, they're just losing games that they should win. They sh just, they're just not a good team at this point. They haven't done anything to make me say they're a good team. It's very clear that you have four teams that are among the top and four teams that are among the bottom. They're clearly one of the bottom four teams. People who put them at three are just like are just like guys who put the Battlehawks at two after week two are people who just want this team to be good, but don't actually let them force them to be good. You know what I mean? There are five, should be at five. If it was, I mean, you could even argue they should be six, but put them at five. Number four is the Michigan Panthers. Panthers are clearly four. Look, they have the best defense in the league. Even though they're third in points allowed and they allow a decent amount of yards, the fact is that they're just the best. Look, the first half, Quentin Dormade played extremely well, from what I heard. Um, but then the second half, which is when a lot of people turn on this game, look, the Panthers just absolutely just obliterated the Brahmas. The Brahmas had like less than 100 yards of total offense in the second half. The Panthers' defense just made Dormade look terrible and made everybody on the Brahmas look terrible. The second half, the Panthers just dominated. The Brahmas got one field goal, and that was it. Now, for the Panthers... The offense is back to looking questionable. They had their one great week last week, and now it's back to being a question mark. Perry got hurt, and they put in Etling. Etling actually looked pretty solid overall, very good completion percentage and yards. But there was this big issue. So they went for the 4th th and 12, converted it, which, again, if the Panthers' offense can do it, then guess what? It probably should be changed, like that I suggested. But they got it. They were about to be in field goal range, and then Etling breaks off a sack, and then... Gets hit by another guy and never goes down, never throws it away, just kind of holds onto the ball and ends up taking like a 20-yard sack. That sack ended the game because then they were stuck at like third or fourth in like 20 and they lost. They were legitimately in striking distance. They were about five-ish yards away from being in very long field goal range, about 15 away from being in really easy field goal range. Would have just gone for the fourth and 12 again, probably would have converted it again and would have had a real shot. The fact is, like I said, the Brahmas in the first half were great, but in the second half got absolutely stifled. The Panthers special teams and defense, you could very much argue, are both the top in the league. Special teams are a bit harder to make the case for, but the defense is the best in the league, I'd say. It's hard to go against it from everything it's it's shown. And this is another time. Another time that the defense holds a team to less than twenty points. It's just the offense isn't doing enough. If this team's offense just gets consistent, and I don't even mean mean good, just consistently mediocre this team is a very, very real threat to win the championship. But again, West Hills once again only had four attempts, but was solid. Colburn was one of his better performances of the year. Jarrett Horst got obliterated, but then they replaced him. Then Ray got hurt. It was, it's just, it, it's just the O line needs to get better. The quarterback play needs to be consistent. If they can continue doing statistically what Etling was doing, minus the interception, they'll be fine. But again, this team is clearly fourth in the league. If they were to play the defenders tomorrow, they would win. But if they were to play a team above them, I don't think they'd win. It's just, it is what it is. It's a very weird team. It's it's a lot like, I don't even know what it's like. It's kind of like the team last year, really. It's that EJ Perry is the, you know, one week he's insanely good, one week he's not. We're being proved that that first week when he came in wasn't a, he didn't have the playbook. It's just that that's how he plays. He's either the best quarterback in the whole league or he's the worst, and there's no in between. So Panthers at four. Current season projection is a playoff team. They are clearly the second best team in the conference. Now, I say that because we need to see another week of the Roughnecks playing good. But so far, the Panthers, we have seen four straight weeks where the defense is holding teams to a very low point total. Yes, they're not shutting out teams, but they're holding teams to less than 20 points on a consistent basis, 20 or less. 
So if you can do that, you're always going to be in a game. You always will be. They held the Battlehawks to 20 or less. They held the Brahmas to 20 or less. They held the Stallions to 20 and less. And the Roughnecks to 20 and less. So, I, I mean, it, it's just, they're clearly a playoff team at this moment. Now, there's a good chance they miss the playoffs because they're only one game ahead of teams like Roughnecks and Showboats. Technically a game and a half of tiebreakers, but the point is that they're a playoff team. When you have a defense that's that good, you have a kicker that can basically kick from anywhere within 65 yards, you're always going to be in games. It's just that this team needs a bit better quarterback play and they can be a real threat. But at the moment, easily four. Number three is the San Antonio Brahmas. Look, Dormady's performance is heavily overrated. I saw him get player of the game from the crew and I was like, what? Look, Dormady's first half from everything I heard was incredible. But you see that 23 of 37? He was like 22 of like 26 or something like that in the first half. His second half was abysmal. He did nothing in the second half. The entire second half, because as I said during the live stream and all that, I need I want to focus on the game I'm watching, which is why I don't do the dual streaming stuff. So I, this game came on with about like a few minutes left in the second quarter when the Birmingham Stallions game got hit with the lightning delay. From as soon as I had the game be put on to the end, Dormaday did nothing. So heavily overrated, just like he was last year. I tried to say that. He was very good or very bad. He was a very inconsistent quarterback, just like EJ Perry, but nobody wanted to believe that. But again, we saw one half he played great, one half he played terribly. It was against the Panthers' defense, but again, it's just... And then once again, the rushing attack, non-existent. This team is much more like the Panthers than a lot of Brahmas fans want to admit. This is a team that's offense is so skeptical. Because, I mean, before you had the consistency of Garbers, who even though... The play calling is kind of questionable with the Brahmas. The fact is that Garber's overall is a very consistent passer. But now it's that the defense is having to carry this team. 66 points allowed, one of the best in the league, allowing less than 260 yards. Incredible. But their rushing attack is pretty poor. Less than 70 yards a game, a 3.1 average. They beat the Panthers. They were overall a very solid team. They won the turnover battle. But again, we're seeing... It, it's just... Justin Smith, John Trey Kirkland both had incredible games. Both had over 100 yards in the game. So, that's basically all of Dormade's yards to those two guys. This is feeling like it's more of a, these receivers are a lot better than, well, not Kirkland, but the rest of them are a lot better than we expected, rather than the Brahmas quarterbacks are really good. That's what it's feeling like now. The Brahmas are a very questionable team. They have upside, but so far we have seen that they have played four games. They have won three of them. They only have one win that's actually a good win, in my opinion, and that was this week. This was a great win. Yes, even though the offense didn't just do bad, it just disappeared in the second half. They got one field goal, and that was it. The fact is, overall, what they did in the first half and what their defense was able to do to the Panthers' offense that went off last week, this was their impressive win. Their win against the defenders week one, not impressive at all. They didn't even really earn that win. It was a right tackle costing them the game. The showboats, a fluke. It, it was. Granted, like I said before, they kind of shot themselves in the leg about seven times with penalties, but still a fluky win. This win was legit. This was their impressive win. There have only been about four impressive wins across the whole season. You had the Stallions and Battlehawks games against the Showboats, the Panthers against the Roughnecks, and then this one. So especially since they did it to a team that just had an impressive win, that's a big deal. And so that's why they jumped to three. They got the win against the Panthers, this was the win that was for the second or third spot in the league. It's just that there's still a question mark at quarterback, and it is a question mark. One good half when it's the first half of a guy playing is not a good thing. He needs to come out in week five and play really good. We'll see. Brahma's at three. Very questionable rushing attack. Still a question mark at quarterback. Receivers a lot better than I expected. Minus Kirkland, we already knew he was a dog. But the rest of them really good. Defense incredible. Play calling, still questionable. Number three. Currently, they're a playoff team. I don't think this is a, at the moment, I don't see them as championship caliber. I need to see something else work on their offense, just like the Panthers. The Panthers' defense, I think, is better. Even though statistically, it's not overall, I think it's a bit better. But the Brahmas' offense, I think, is a bit better than the Panthers' offense. But the point is that the Brahmas' offense hasn't shown me enough especially with Garbers out, to say, yeah, this team could win the championship. When your offense can just go limp in half the way they did, that's tough. Man, it really is. And then 
when your rushing game, their rushing attack has not been good at all this year. You're not going to win the championship game with without a rushing attack. I mean, the Renegades, they had a rushing attack last year. The Stallions, they've had a rushing attack both years of the USFL. The Brahmas, if they were to win the championship, they'd have the worst rushing attack by a mile. So without it, I don't know. They're probably a playoff team. They're 3-1. and one. They're off to a great start. They have a plus 19 point differential. One of only three teams to have that. But at the same time, it's just two of your wins were really fluky. Your loss was a loss. You know, you did lose, but... And it was a pretty bad loss. The score made it a lot closer than it really was. So you're clearly behind the Battlehawks. Now, yes, part of that is now the question of about Garbers and the play calling, but you still did get beat pretty bad by the Battlehawks. So you're clearly a step below them. And you're about the same tier as the Panthers, really, which is a team that's a step below the top teams. So the Brahmas at three, they deserve to be a top three team. But with your offense looking so questionable and that your quarterback being so heavily praised for one good half, I need to see more. I'm not going to just say, oh yeah, Dormade is a top three quarterback. Like I saw a Reddit post put Dormade is like the second best quarterback in the league now. And I'm like, dude, he had one half. He had one half. That's not good enough. And especially last year, we saw him. Again, I still stand by and I'll keep saying it. McClendon is a better quarterback. Dormade is good. He's not McClendon. McClendon, underrated. Dormade, overrated. Dormade currently, mediocre. One great half, one terrible half. That spells out a mediocre quarterback. So we'll see. He needs to come out next week and have a full good game to shed the mediocre label. Because if you have a half like he did, that second half against Michigan was horrid. But nobody wants to talk about it. So until we see him actually put a full good game, you got to view him as mid at best. So because of that, Brahmas are a playoff team, not a championship team. If they can get their running game better and they can get Dormade better, then they're a championship team. Number two is St. Louis Battlehawks. Obvious. I mean, the Battlehawks fans were, very, were, were overrating this team heavily throughout the early parts of the season. This is when you can actually rate them properly at two. They didn't beat the Showboats. They decimated them. They obliterated them. 32-17. to 17. Look, the Showboats won the second quarter. That's all they did. After that, it was nothing. Yes, the Battlehawks offense didn't end up doing a ton in the third quarter. It just, Battlehawks won this game, and it wasn't really that close. Even though the score in the like first half is a lot closer than it is, nah. The only question mark is that McCarron, once again, had a pretty, just not great performance. Again, a lot of short passes, boring 35 completions for 222 is a pretty terrible stat line. But three touchdowns, a 78 completion percentage, only one interception is good. Jacob Saylor's 100 yards. That's their second 100-yard rushing performance, and they've had it from two different running backs. The fact they have two different running backs who can do this is a big deal. Their punt net average and their kick return average, two very good, you know, kind of tertiary stats that are very big, they're the best in. So when they're punting, they're getting the most out of it, and when they're returning kicks, they're getting the most out of it. Their rushing game is the second best in the league. That's really good. And again, third down percentage, they were 9-15 against the Showboats. I mean, come on. Four sacks without their two best players, which granted, it's inflated because it's against the Showboats, but their yards per play is once again really good at five. The, the Battlehawks are clearly the second best team in the league. They have a great passing attack, a great rushing attack. The only question is their defense still is somewhat questionable. Against a team with no offensive line, you still allowed 17 points. You did have four sacks and you were missing a couple guys. And that's a big question. They keep getting banged up. They need to be fully healthy. But at the moment, they're clearly the second best team in the league. Now, they are a championship caliber team. At this point, it's hard to say they're not. When you have one of the best rushing attacks in the league, and you have one of, if not the very best quarterback in the league at this point in the season, it's just, I mean, come on. Look, McCarron's been playing very boring football the past couple weeks. Very, you know, low-risk throws. But at the end of the day, he still is playing much better than basically every other quarterback. Now, yes, with guys like Kukas, Prez, and Tayamu, it's about their O-line being pretty bad. But Prez did have his worst game this week. But they're still winning. They have a great rushing attack. They have absolutely great receivers. They got Jacor Pearson back. And even though he had one fumble, he overall was incredible this game. So now you're adding another huge threat to that receiving core, which already had guys like Shepard and Aitman. 
and Butler, yeah, this team's really good. This team's defense needs to step it up a bit, but their offense is looking incredible. Easily the second best team in the league, easily a championship team. Number one is the Stallions. Look, I've seen people say that they shouldn't be because their game against the defenders wasn't good. I'll have to say this. If you're a stat guy, the Stallions aren't just kind of. They obliterate the Battlehawks. The Battlehawks are nothing compared to them. Because statistically, number one in passing yards, Stallions. Yards per game, Stallions. Rushing yards, Stallions. Points allowed, Stallions. Kicking points, Stallions. And a bunch of other stats, they're right on up there as well. And again, this is with them still not using the right quarterback. Look, Skip Holtz is basically... He, he, what he has basically said is, we are so much better than the rest of the league, we will use the worst quarterback only to get him film and be nice to him than actually try to win games. That's literally what he's doing. Because through four weeks, it, it's it's not even close. Martinez is the better quarterback. Look, Matt Corral statistically wasn't terrible. 19-29 to 29 for 240 a TD, no interceptions, 66 complete percentage. But, and he had 51 yards on the ground on seven carries. Martinez played a hell of a lot better in his start. Yes, it was rain, but aside from that, like, early on, couple of bad throws in the first game, Martinez has been the better quarterback. He should be the starter. Corral is the worst of the two starters, and he still was able to be as good as he was. Look, the Stallions just beat the defenders. Again, like I said, they handed the game, and they still won. They had zero sacks. They had the most sacks in the league by a country mile as well, and still have the most sacks in the league. They got none of them. Still were able to win. They lost the turnover battle. Still won. They were 0-4 in the red zone. Still won. 3 of 11 on third down. Still won. I mean, what are you going to say? The Stallions were the better team against the defenders. It took a couple of fumbles to make it close, and even then it really wasn't. Like, it, it didn't end up doing anything. Stallions are the best team in the league. Again, until they lose, you have to put them number one. Because if they're not losing, I mean, what are you going to say? That, I mean... Like, Pete, it's just, I don't buy the Battlehawks are better than the Stallions argument. Statistically, the Stallions are a better team. I test the Stallions are a better team, especially with Martinez in at quarterback. Because, again, this was them not actually trying. If you have Corral in at this point on, you're not trying. If you have Martinez in, you're trying. Martinez has been the better quarterback. I know people want to hype up Corral more because he was actually a drafted quarterback, you know, like a third-round pick. But Martinez's one game he played last week was a hell of a lot better than Corral's game this week. And there's a dynamic. I mean, week one, Martinez had a couple bad throws. But Corral did literally nothing until that Deion Kane touchdown pass. It's just Martinez has been the better guy. I hope he's back as the starter. But as long as the Stallions can do this, if they're able to get away with literally swapping the starter week to week, they're just laughing at the rest of the league at how much better they are. They're, they're a championship caliber team. They're, they are the favorite. They are the best team in the league. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, their point differential, so much better than the rest of the league. Plus 41 is unbelievable. They're winning games by over 10 points a game. Technically 10.25 points a game they're winning by. I mean, the Battlehawks are 23. They're almost a double what the Battlehawks are. Stallions are number one, not even close. So I'll do it for this week's Power Rankings video. This has been Zon Fox. If you enjoyed this content, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell. We are getting closer to 750 subscribers. So hopefully we can get there. Remember, we are doing a giveaway at 1,000 subscribers. And as always, have a great night.